power lines have become such a common sight, we barely notice them anymore. For that matter, we barely notice how big a part this power plays in our lives. How many jobs electrical energy helps us to make easier. It helps us to brighten up things or to make them darker. We use it to heat up things. We use it to cool things down. We use it to get things wet and clean or dry and clean. It helps us to sort things out or to mix things up. It helps us to take things apart or put them together. We use it to start things or to stop things. It helps to lift up and to bring down. We find it handy in helping us to subtract or take things away and just as handy in adding up things. It helps bring us things we want and get rid of things we don't want. It helps us to do exciting things or things which calm us down. Well, we could go on, but you get the idea. Electricity, the energy which flows through these lines, helps us do so many things that our way of life would be impossible without it. Yet it serves us at the turn of a dial, the push of a button, or at the flick of a switch. Remarkable, really, yet so dependable a part of our lives that we barely think about where this power comes from or how much of it we use. The fact is that we in the Sacramento area use more electricity than most people. First, because we're a modern and growing community in which electricity plays so vital a part. Second, because electricity costs so little. We'd like to talk about a remarkable blend of ideas, materials, and jobs which makes so much electricity available to so many. This is where it comes from, a generator. And as you know, generators are the source of all the electric power we use. Suppose we begin with a review of the principle, the idea which is behind this complex machine. Here is the basic setup, first developed by Michael Faraday in 1831. Like many great ideas, it is astonishingly simple. Imagine, take a coil of wire, revolve it within a magnetic field, and electricity is produced. Hard to believe, but this simple principle is behind all the electric power we have today. But to put this idea to practical use was a real challenge to man's ingenuity. For example, it takes power to revolve the coil. And when generators reach this size, the power needed is tremendous. And here again, man's practicality comes to the fore. Consider this simplified version of a generator. It is the turbine, or bladed wheel, which spins the coil within a magnetic field. But what spins the turbine? One power source is steam. By releasing its pressure against the blades, the turbine turns, spins the coil within a magnetic field, transforming steam power to electrical energy. But it takes heat to transform water to steam. Where may the heat come from? It may come from coal, from oil, from gas, and more recently, from the atom itself, which will soon be a source of heat used in many areas, including our own. However, there is a way to eliminate the need for heat and to cut down costs. First, Change the form of the turbine from a many-bladed wheel to a bucket wheel. Then, use the power of water itself wherever this is possible. That is, where the water is high enough to be brought downhill in penstocks and its very weight becomes the basic power source for hydroelectric generators. A powerhouse is the usual shelter for the generators. How is this basic idea brought to life? The water comes down with terrific force through these long pipe extensions called penstocks. This immense water force is aimed directly at a turbine wheel, like this one, which, as it spins, revolves the coil in its magnetic field and transforms water power into electrical energy. This is hydroelectric power, one of the least expensive ways to produce electricity, especially for the district we live in, 
Close to Sacramento are the rugged slopes of the Crystal Range, part of the High Sierra. Here, in El Dorado County, every winter for centuries, nature has deposited deep snowpacks on these mountains. For centuries, the snow melted and ran wastefully to the sea. To be sure, it was in these rivers and streams that gold was discovered, yet how trifling was the gold when compared to this immense water energy wastefully lost each year to the Pacific. While some of it had been tapped, most of it was waiting to be developed. Since hydroelectric generation is one of the cheapest sources of electric power, the Upper American River project was conceived by SMUD to supply low-cost power to its many customers. Developing a natural resource for the benefit of many people required wide-range exploration to assure the soundest, most economic planning. Teams of engineering experts were employed to study the area and design a plan to develop the most electricity at the lowest possible cost. Here, in a 250-mile area, were five different Sierra watersheds, a wealth of water power waiting to be put to work. To harness this stairway of power called for the construction of 12 dams. Each dam is designed to store the water so that we always have a controllable water supply, a storehouse of potential power. Canals, tunnels, and penstock are needed to direct this water into the eight powerhouses where its pressure spins the huge generators and produces the many thousands of kilowatt hours of electrical energy we use every day. And notice, this is truly a stairway of power. The water drops from over 6,500 feet at Rubicon to 1,000 feet at Chili Bar, a graduated drop of over a mile in which the same water is used over and over again to generate more power. All this is here now. But in the early 50s, there was nothing here. It was just an idea. What did it take to bring this idea to life? long-range planning, and practical skills, the ability to overcome all obstacles at the lowest possible cost. For example, here is one of the dams in our system. Its job is to develop a dependable supply for our water needs, our power needs, or both. How is this done? Imagine a flowing river. To create a lake or reservoir, we simply dam its flow. But dams take several forms. The heart of every dam is its core, strong enough to hold the water back and made of a material through which water cannot move. There are concrete dams in which the core is concrete and because concrete is strong enough, the core can stand alone. There are earth-filled dams. Here, the center core is compacted clay material. It is flanked by gravel to keep the water from washing the core away. Heavy banks of earth on both sides give solid support to the core zone. There are rock-fill type dams in which the clay core is flanked by heavy rock to give it strength. In this smud plan, all types were used, dams of so many types and sizes that this project has been called a classroom for hydroelectric development. But here again, decisions and choices have to be made. What type of dam will serve best and where exactly shall it be placed? While the principles are simple, their execution is complex. Is there rock close by, or the right kind of clay, or gravel? Only after building time and transportation costs are estimated can a wise choice be made. Once all these decisions were made, the job got underway. The first job was the building of access roads through all kinds of terrain to the key sites, roads over which all kinds of equipment and endless tons of material can move during the construction phase. Once the access roads are ready, dam construction begins. And that is much more than simply piling material across a canyon. Here, in the ice house location, a rock fill dam was called for. But before any dam can be built, the terrain must be cleared. No dam can be safely built on a loose or shifting base. It must have a solid base area, strong enough to support the dam's massive weight. To make sure the dam's impervious core has a truly solid base, the area is thoroughly cleared. Using such equipment as this 
hydraulic monitor, a jet stream of water washes the base right down to bedrock. The next job is to put the right material in the right place. As an example, look at some of the details of material placement in the building of a rock fill dam at Ice House. Giant earth movers haul in the red clay to build up the core. As the clay is put down in layer after layer, it is wetted to the right consistency. Then the sheep's foot compactors move in to pack the clay and remove any possible air or water pockets and make the core impervious or leak proof. As the core builds up, gravel and heavy rock are put in at both sides of it to give added strength and support. To ensure the rock's permanent and firm placement, they are thoroughly cleansed of all loose material and so skillfully positioned that they become practically immovable. So was built the rock fill dam at Ice House, almost a third of a mile long and 148 feet high. A much bigger job was the dam at Union Valley. This dam is one of the biggest earth fill types in California, 430 feet high and half a mile thick at its base. To back up the big silver into a 2,800 acre lake called for the movement of 10 million cubic yards of earth, enough to fill a train of boxcars stretching the length of California. Why a concrete dam at junction? The same reason which applied to the building of all the dams in this project. In each section, build the type of dam which will harness the most water energy at the lowest cost. But whatever the type dam, each one creates a lake or reservoir. This, you recall, becomes our dependable source of water power. But how do we guide the water from these man-made lakes to the powerhouses? A major method is through tunnels, moving the water from the lake to the penstock, and then the steep drop into the powerhouse. And what does it take to build a tunnel? Even with the most modern equipment, the most skilled hard rock miners were often slowed down to just 150 feet a week. Driving tunnels is a tedious job. First, a series of holes must be drilled into the solid rock. These are then loaded with dynamite, and when the blast is set off, rock for maybe only 10 feet has been loosened. This must be taken away before a new set of holes is drilled. All told, the Upper American River Project called for 10 tunnels, totaling over 20 miles of drilling and blasting through earth and rock. And even as this went on, the building of Penstock was underway, pipelines to carry the water from tunnels down to powerhouses. This too isn't as simple as it looks. Above the Jaybird powerhouse, for example, a special tramway had to be built to haul men, materials, and equipment up and down the steep mountainside. This particular Penstock was designed to direct water to two generators. It called for 10-foot diameter pipe running 2,500 feet down the side of Jaybird Canyon. All penstocks lead to powerhouses, and the project has eight powerhouses. Such equipment as turbines and generators have an unusual combination of massiveness and precision, so their installation requires the utmost care, this to achieve balanced movement. Here are tons of metals so built and installed that once in operation, they move at high speeds, generate great power, and do it with apparent ease. From such powerhouses, located deep in canyons, power must be delivered over miles of transmission lines. These lines and towers don't just happen either, not in this terrain. Some places were so inaccessible that the most economical way to build transmission towers was with the help of helicopters to fly in men, equipment, and even such things as wet concrete as in this canvas bag. Power from SMUD's hydroelectric development in El Dorado County is now delivered to the Sacramento area through 60 miles of transmission lines, lines moving over mountains, down into the valley, and to the Sacramento Municipal Utility District service area. But what are these mysterious things? And what role do they play in this complex system? They are transformers. The system has thousands of transformers of all sizes, and while transformers may look complicated, their job is simple. Change the flood of electric power, which originates at the powerhouses, 
down to the voltage level needed by the final user. This substation, for example, is fed 230,000 volts from the generators. As it moves through this transformer, the voltage is reduced to 69,000 volts per power line. As the lines move closer to your home, transformers continue the reduction of voltage until the lines reach your home. There, your home transformer can bring you the exact amount of voltage needed to do the many other jobs which call for electrical energy. But while electrical energy is the main product of our system, it has had many byproducts. Remember the roads built to carry materials to construction sites? The same roads are now used for recreation by campers, fishermen, or just sightseers. And they are widely used by travelers from all over the state. While the lakes were primarily built for water power, they too have become recreation areas for the entire family. Backdrop by the beautiful Crystal Range, they are ideal as rest areas or playgrounds. And here is a fisherman's paradise in the making. Each dam has a fish water release valve for better water control. With better water control, streams in the project now flow more evenly for better fishing. And to make the fish plentiful, fingerlings by the thousands are planted in the reservoirs by the California Department of Fish and Game. Yes, in the early 50s, this area was lovely to look at, but it was beyond the reach of most people. It has now become a widely used recreation area, but most important, it has been put to the service of men. From this area, we have built a stairway of power ready to deliver annually enough electricity to supply 200,000 homes in the Sacramento district. Here is the headquarters building, the nerve center of the entire project and the area it serves. SMUD has one consistent target, to deliver all the electrical energy you need, deliver it dependably and safely, and deliver it at the lowest possible cost. But now think back. Here for centuries, water flowed down the hills, through the valleys, and out to the sea. Here was a tremendous source of energy, wasted and unused, and which is now put to work for all of us. Remarkable? The next time you flick a switch, just think about the amazing things behind it. The amazing capacity of men to discover ideas. Their amazing capacity to see the possibilities in these ideas. Their amazing capacity to give these ideas form and substance by coordinating the mind and muscle of thousands of other men. Their amazing capacity to overcome all the natural barriers which are found in any job. Think of the thousands of ideas and skills in this seemingly simple scene and the purpose of all this coordinated effort to so master the forces of nature that they are put to the use of man. Amazing? We think so. But here is the most amazing part of the whole business. Electrical energy has become so routine a part of our lives and so much is delivered by so few people that most of us can move around in a much brighter world without the slightest idea as to the hows and whys behind it. Hmm, isn't it all astonishing? Especially when you realize that over half the people on this earth have no electricity at all. <laughs>